Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our virtual Haunted Tea House event. My name is Heather Jean Ewell and I'm one of the librarians at Everett Community College, but I'm very, very pleased to be your ghostess with the mostess for tonight's festivities. Before we get started, and as we continue to invite souls to join our festivities tonight, wanted to share just a little bit about um, what you're experiencing right now. And of course, technical difficulties always. All right. We are recording for those who can't attend. And so everyone's audio and video has been disabled. Please help us out by making sure that you don't fiddle with those settings so we can capture the best first take of our stories for the evening. We've got lots of nonverbal feedback buttons available. You can give us thumbs up, you can clap. We hope that you'll enjoy a spirited evening of stories tonight. We also have automatic captions for you folks out there who might enjoy those. Um, they're turned on right now for everyone, but if it's not your cup of tea and you'd like to turn them off, look in the bottom right corner of your screen and you'll see a more button. Click on that and you'll be able to click on hide subtitles to make those go away. And thank you for excusing any robotic shenanigans. These are automatically created for us. And it's uh, my great pleasure to welcome to speak right now and introduce our Japanese Culture Club president, Oliver. And so Oliver, I would love if you would take a moment to share with us about our club. Hello, hello. Can you see me? We can. Thank you, Oliver. Well, uh, hello to everybody who has joined us tonight. Uh, I'm Oliver, part-time mad scientist and president of the Japanese Culture Club. And I would like to thank all of you for taking your time out of your busy schedules to attend our first Haunted Tea House experience. Uh, as the president of Japanese Culture Club, we would like to, I would like to uh, invite all those who enjoy this event and our previous events uh, to um, check us out. I know it's very difficult um, for especially EVC, student, EVCC students to uh, interact with other, uh, other peers. And so I, um, I am extending this uh, hand uh, as an invitation for you to uh, join uh, Japanese Culture Club. Uh, if you would like the more information, then you can always email our ghostess advisor, Heather Genio, with the Zoom, uh, with the uh, email link hu.evertcc.edu. The purpose of Japanese Culture Club is to promote international goodwill by expand, uh, expanding community pers uh, perspective of Japanese culture, history, language, arts, and arts through interactive events such as Haunted Tea House. And with more members, hopefully we could do more events for the community and have exciting storytelling or other uh, things with you guys. Thank you very much and enjoy the show. Thank you so much. Abby. And so, um... One of the things that Japanese Culture Club loves to do as part of our uh, cultural outreach events is to sponsor uh, Goodwill. And our ongoing um, benefit that we sponsor at all of our um, haunted tea houses is the EVCC Food Pantry. 
making sure that everyone has enough to eat is something that is very close to our hearts. And we hope that you will consider um, purchasing donations um, that can be sent through socially distanced means to support the uh, Campus Pantry, which is a student-led and free service available to EVCC students and employees who are experiencing food insecurity. We have some links on the screen that can help you follow up if you'd like to help. Um, you can purchase donations through Amazon at tinyurl.com slash EVCC Pantry. You can also donate directly at the EVCC Foundation, which you can find on the college's website. And thank you very much to making, uh, for making uh, a small chip in uh, the big block to ensure that we can all enjoy a good meal in these very difficult times. And uh, another thing that we always like to do with our haunted tea houses is um, make sure that we're building community. And a consent to be scared is a big important part of us setting up our events to make sure everybody has fun. Uh, tonight's gonna be scary. There's gonna be some, um, some jarring moments. So um, be prepared for that. And we also wanna make sure that everyone's comfortable. And so it's always important to talk about things that might make people um, feel not in a good space. So um, there's gonna be um, mentions of um, some difficult topics tonight, but in very um, careful ways that are not exploitive. But if any of this sounds like, you know what, not for me tonight, that's totally fine. And we wanna give you that chance. But if you're in the mood, for a little bit of scariness, please do stick around because we've got some fun stories to share with you tonight. And that brings you to our first story of the evening, Kuchisaka Ona, the split mouth woman. It's interesting how familiar surroundings can become so scary, particularly when not surrounded by those that make us feel comfortable. Kana was a very strange girl. Kana couldn't seem to make friends in the village that she had been born and raised her entire life. Kana kept to herself and didn't go out of the way to be noticed. Kana wasn't like the other girls with their cell phones and their Instagrams and always wanting to take pictures. Oh, look, look how pretty I am. Look how pretty I am. Unfortunately, the other girls were not nice to Kana because despite all of her efforts, they noticed her. The mean girls always picked on Kana, following her home as she walked alone to the empty apartment where she lived with her mother, who always worked long hours. Always, always the mean girls taunting Kana. Hey, Kana, smile, smile for us, Kana. Until Kana couldn't take it and she ran. And of course, the mean girls chased because easy prey is always a fun catch. Kana went down a long winding path that she had always followed by herself, a small alley pressed between many buildings. Many times she had walked that alley, but today something was different. As she went down that long and frightening alley, she noticed a shadow keeping pace with her. Something about it was strange, tall, spindly, like a woman with long black hair, moving just as fast as she was, just behind her over her shoulder, even though that alley was barely wide enough for her. She ducked into a side passage that only she knew of and watched as her classmates went by one by one, calling and cackling and taunting. Kana, wait for us, Kana. And then they stopped. She heard the clattering of their shoes come to a pause. And she heard a woman's voice. Am I pretty? She heard her classmates stop and cackle and laugh. Look at this old hag. No, of course you're not pretty. Look at your long disheveled hair. Look at your filthy clothes. What are you doing here? No, get out of our way. Get out of our way. 
Am I pretty? They heard the woman ask again. With gasps, hands, screams. Her friends went running, running, running down that path back the way they had come. Frightened of what had come to pass, Kana crept forward to peek out and find standing in the midst of the alley a woman taller than she'd ever seen, long black hair, tangled and full of weeds. In her hand, a pair of scissors, like the old ones you see on teacher's desks, rusty and sharp nonetheless. Creeping out, Kana came up to this figure. Who are you, man? What are you doing here? The woman looked at her. story because it gets told again and again in different ways. Kuchisaki Ona, the spook mouth woman, is actually quite young in the pantheon of the spooky stories that we get told, mostly coming out of Japan. And we'll talk more about those in a moment. What I like about the Kuchisaki Ona myth is much like the memes that we have today. She changes, she morphs, she evolves in some stories instead of a pair of scissors. She has a sickle that she uses to split your mouth from ear to ear. In other stories, you have to say a magic chant, pomade, 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 like hair gel can save you from ghosts and back alleys. But there was a real panic around Kuchisake Ona in the 1970s. People actually thought that she was real and children were put on curfew. And one of the things that I love about yokai, stories about ghost goblins and ghouls from Japan, is a quite long tradition, which you'll hear more about tonight. If you'd like to read more, we have a book in the library called Pandemonium and Parade by Michael Dillon Foster. And you can read how these ghosts and ghouls of old have evolved into the future to now. And we meet them on a daily basis in video games, in animated films, and comic books. But you never know when you'll run into Kuchisaki Ona. She could be around the corner. But if she asks you, am I pretty? Say neither yes nor no. Shrug and go, no, no, so, so. All of these stories are part of kaidan. Kaidan are spooky, strange tales. And there are many of them that have been gathered together into anthologies over time. And if you're interested in reading more right now, you can actually go to Project Gutenberg and you can read an anthology put together by Lafcadio Hearn, 19th century um, uh, uh, journalist who fell in love with Japan and collected them for us. And what's interesting about Kaidan is the Kai. And let's talk about that for a moment because I love the history of stories. And, but I promise you, I'll get back to those scary stories. That's one of the things about hanging out with a librarian. I'm always going to tell you interesting things. <laughs> Etymology is the history of words. And so there you see kaidan. The writing system that we're looking at right now is kanji. Kanji is one of the writing systems used in Japan. And it actually comes from China originally, the ideograms that you see here. And notice how I've got the red highlighted again and again. Well, yokai. Yokai are those ghost ghouls and goblins that you might be familiar with, with Pokemon. 
the packet monsters. Those monsters are yokai. Ayakashi. Ayakashi is an ancient term, but it also has that character in there, but it's pronounced in a different way. There's also mononoke, mononoke, mysterious things. Again, that K is the same character as the kai. It's just pronounced differently. All of these things are strange, mysterious, and uncanny. And you might be familiar with mononoke from Princess Mononoke, the animated film from Studio Jupiter. This again, this mysterious otherworldly term is applied to all of the ghosts and spirits that live in the forest gods domain. And it's interesting, this tradition is quite old and the, the, the telling of spooky tales is something that touches on every culture throughout the globe. But how did we get Kaiden? How did we get here today to have, you know, Kuchisakeona and all of these ghosts and ghouls that live in our pockets? Well, um, way back during the Sengoku period, the Warring States period, they used to tell a hundred Buddhist stories to conjure a miracle in really deep and dark times. It was a way for communities to come together to spread hope and um, look to better times. Those stories are sometimes told by itinerant wandering storytellers, the otogishu. And those storytellers were sometimes priests, sometimes wandering monks, and they were said to have mystical powers associated with them. Hence, they turn up in the stories again and again until the, the otogishu become signifiers for, oh, this is kaidan, we're hearing spooky stories because we have a wandering storyteller. And again, it pops up in anime all the time. You might be familiar with the mononoke series and the city Uri is a wandering medicine seller, but he's also a demon exorcist. And again, this brings us back to the Tokugawa era. So way back 1600s through 1850s. Um, this was a very prosperous time that came out of the warring states period. So um, the government stabilized, um, uh, there became a flourishing of the arts and there were printing presses that made it possible for cheap literature to be created and purchased by an increasingly literate society. And what did people do? They got together and they told ghost stories because it's fun. And so that's what's happening here in this uh, Japanese woodblock print by Hokusai. And you might be familiar with Hokusai from, from the Great Wave of Kanagawa. And what happens is, um, it generally in the summertime, when the telling of spooky tales is supposed to send a chill down your spine in the hot um, afternoon and evenings of the, um, the hottest time of year, people would get together in tea houses or at friends' places or out in the middle of nowhere. And the way it goes is you would light a hundred candles and everyone would tell their spooky story. And one by one, the candles would be extinguished. And one by one, everyone would tell their tale. And by the end of this telling, it would be in the middle of the night and in the middle of the dark. And with the extinguishing of that last candle and the telling of that last tale, you were said to be conjuring something supernatural. And that, my friends, is Yaku Monigatari Kaidan Kai, the telling of the hundred strange tales. And you can see in the print here that these fellows got more than they bargained for. They thought they were telling spooky tales, but they ended up summoning a bunch of yokai that are like, oh, keep telling stories, friend. We want to hear more about all of our fun exploits, which brings us again to spooky tales, the giant's hand. Long, long ago, as the stories always go, in the middle of nowhere, in the mountains high and far away from the city, there was not much to do for fun. And all the young men of the village, thinking themselves brave young fellows, decided, let's go out to the abandoned mansion that's out at the edge of town. Let's tell tales, spooky, chilling tales, to prove our bravery. So we spend the night out there, and then everyone in the village will know, oh, look at these brave young men. They went out into that haunted mansion and they stayed all night long. We can trust them. They know what they're doing. 
And so the young men went out and they went and dug around and found a room that wasn't completely in disrepair. And they found some mats that were good enough to keep them from the bugs and the rot. And they made a cozy little light for themselves out of an old lamp that had been knocked over. And they gathered, huddled together there, listening to the evening sounds and telling stories from far and wide, strange tales of all kinds of things that go bump in the night. And at one by one, they told their stories until the last young man was left shivering with terror as his friends looked on. Go on, go on, they said, tell your last tale. Let us see if we can see a ghost. What fun, what fun. But no, that young man was terrified. He said, no, no, we mustn't, we mustn't. So scared was he, he ran off and went home. And all of his friends laughed at him as he went. And they said, ah, we are brave young men. We will stay here. Tomorrow, we will make fun of our friend who is not brave enough to stay with us. And so off they drifted, slowly, as they listened to the evening sounds. The crickets, the, air, the wind, oh, until it stopped. Not quite sure if they were awake or asleep, lying on the mats on the floor, looking up overhead into the dark, they saw a monstrous hand peel from the shadows there, hovering over them, so huge, so monstrous, it seemed to fill the very room and exceed it until it could have crushed the very sky. With a shriek of terror, one of the young men leapt to his feet and struck out with his sword, striking that, that mighty hand about to fall. And then such a strange thing, it vanished. And then there was a little thing fell from above and landed beside him. The tiniest little spider, no bigger than your thumb, had been dangling high above from the ceiling, had dropped down in front of that old lamp and cast such shadow upon the wall, making them think that that little tiny spider was a monstrous giant hand. And they felt so foolish they did, how terrified they were of such a simple thing. And feeling terrible, they didn't give their friend any trouble the next day, because who knows when a spider the size of your thumb could be as big as a giant's hand. What's fun about the Kaiden is they're full of transformations. They don't always have to be spooky in terms of ghosts and, and haunting, chilling things. They can be funny. They can just be weird. That's the fun about Kaidan, is they're just as diverse as all of us. And that brings us to another of our ghoulish bumps in the night, the Bakemono, the trickster changing things. And you're quite familiar with these, I'm sure you've seen them in all kinds of animated films, video games, maybe comic books and whatnot. It's said that these trickster animals can transform into all kinds of things. We have lovely raccoon here. Tanuki, the raccoon dog, very indigenous to the area of Japan, special, not quite a raccoon, but because of his long tail, he's said to be able to transform into all kinds of things, including tea kettles and beautiful young women. There's Nekomata, the trickster cat, who again can transform, and notice this cat has two tails. And what else do we have here cavorting around? Moles. What? This is a lovely um, a drawing um, that is by Kyosai. Kyosai is said to be the grandfather of all yokai because of his fantastic drawings. But notice the creature in the bottom left corner. What is it? Is it a fox? Is it a weasel? Some say it might be a badger, a very particular type of badger, not the ones that we're used to with the, um, the black stripes and the white bellies, but again, Creatures with tails can sometimes grow old, and they are said to sprout another on their 100th birthday that allows them to transform and deceive. And that brings us to the next tale of the evening. Regina, the Badger. Way long ago, as these stories always go, there was an old merchant man who had a shop in the heart of Edo. Edo was the name for Tokyo way back again. 
This shop was right on the edge of an old, old park, a bit of wild, still left in the city. It belonged to people during the day. In fact, everyone loved to go strolling through those lovely trees and along the rivers and small ponds during the day. But at night, no one dared to go there. At night, it belonged to the Okai, not to humans. But this old merchant man, oh, he was so tired. He was so tired. He didn't want to have to go all the way around to get home. He thought to himself, I'm so old. No yokai will bother with me. I'm nothing but skin and bones. There's no meat on me to eat. Surely they'll let me pass. So he decided that he would walk through the park rather than going around because he was so ready to be home. And off he went after closing up his shop and blowing out all the lanterns before it, off into the path, into the, the, the lovely forest that was rather sinister at night. As he went, all the sounds changed around him. But this was no longer a place for humans. As he wandered, shivering to himself, wondering, I should turn back. I should turn back. No, how foolish I was. I'm not. I don't belong here. He heard in the distance another strange sound. What is that? What is that there? <laughs> is, that a woman? is that a woman crying? Oh no, someone is stuck. Someone is stuck in the park. Like me, maybe they got lost. I must go and help. And as that old merchant man went tottering along the path, he saw in the distance a young woman hunkered down, very much afraid, hiding her face in her sleeves, crying so piteously. And the old man went up to the young woman. Oh, young woman, please don't cry. Everything will be fine. Please let me help you. Please, oh, don't be shy. This little young woman was hiding her face in her sleeves, refusing to look at the old man. Let me see your pretty smile, young lady. Please, please. Shyly, the young woman rose. Shyly, she cozied up to the old man and lowering her sleeve, revealed that her face was as smooth as an egg, for she had none whatsoever to reveal. Horrified, the old merchant ran, stumbling backwards, tripping through the mud, and stumbling through the bushes back out of that park, and took the long way, all the way around. Back home he went, clattering into the back kitchen where his wife was waiting for him there. Oh, wife, wife, you will never believe, you will never believe what I came upon tonight. And his wife kept her back to him. Like, really, do tell, do tell what you saw. And he said, wife, I was in the park. Why were you in the park? That's not where people belong after night. Well, I was lazy, wife. I wanted the shortcut. You should never take the shortcut, darling. Wife, when I'm talking to you, look at me. Look what has happened to me. And then it slowly but surely, a wife stood up and turned to see her husband and aghast. He stumbled back, for much like that young woman in the park, his wife had no face at all. <laughs> Continuing the path alongside our tricksters, the next story comes to us from EVCC alumni and Japanese club uh, member Rochelle, who is going to tell us the tale of the spider pool. Long, long ago, hidden within the thickest of trees, lay a pool endlessly fed by a large waterfall. Beautiful as it may be, it held danger. A Jorogumo called these falls home, waiting patiently for young, handsome men to come close and become ensnared in her webs. One day, a woodcutter came to the pool to work on the trees. He was old, wrinkly and dried up from age, but what is the difference between a moth and a fly when flesh is desired? The woodcutter worked long and hard, but became tired 
tired and decided to take a long nap against a tree by the bank. Look at this human, so weak and lazy that he must rest while the sun still shines her heavenly rays upon my pool, the Jorogumo thought to herself. Eating him would be a mercy. Jorogumo sent her spiders towards the woodcutter, one by one, climbing onto his leg and wrapping around fine threads until the most beautiful of ropes held fast to her intended she pulled the rope and it barely budged, like the woodcutter was that of a tree. Tugging and tugging, the rope pulled in, and instead of an old man, there now laid a large tree in the pool. The old woodcutter had discovered the spiders and tied the rope to a tree, curious to know what would happen. When the tree was pulled into the pool, he fled, leaving the Jorogumo exhausted and enraged. Many days went by, and the nearby village stayed away from the beautiful waterfall and clear pools, for fear that the next man to visit would never return. But it does not matter for the Jorogumo, for men are weak of heart to beauty, and when they come near, well, as evident by the ever-growing collection of aging skulls, nothing holds stronger than a spider and her web. In addition to our trickster creatures, we also have the Tsukumogami. These, like those long-lived animals, are everyday objects made from natural materials. It is said that once they reach a certain age, they come alive and take on a spirit of their own. Hence, we have to be careful with the heirlooms that have been gifted us and ensure that we don't give away things that have, um, let's see, opinions about their care for they can come back and haunt us in ways that we might never anticipate. And so um, that brings us to our next story, The Haunted Kimono. Back in old Edo, a merchant man had only a daughter left him. His wife had passed long ago due to illness, his brothers the same. All he had was his young daughter, whom he doted over, but sadly she was sickly, and he worried she was not long for this world. She would sit up on the top of their second floor at the balcony, looking out over the street, humming to herself happily as she thought upon better days. To cheer his daughter up, he thought, oh, why not commission a beautiful kimono for her, a wedding kimono? that she can look upon as it hangs on the wall and think of the bright future ahead of her. Oh, how brightly his daughter smiled as she looked at this gorgeous kimono fashioned just for her. Humming happily, she looked at the beautiful long white sleeves embroidered with gold and with beautiful red peonies upon them and blushed pink like the sunset outside, thinking of fond and future times. Unfortunately, those times were never to come as she grew sicklier and sicklier until one summer's afternoon, she was no more. Oh, that merchant man was so sad, so very, very sad, but he could not bear to part with that kimono that reminded him so of his young daughter. And so he left it hanging on the wall there, looking at it often, too often. In the middle of summer, not long after she had passed, he heard a strange noise at sunset, the twilight hour, the oni hour, when the worlds are at their thinnest, and strange things are said to happen. What is that sound? I hear so familiar to me. My daughter? The clearest day, he heard her upstairs on the balcony humming, though there was not a soul in the house except him and the kimono upon the wall. Terrified to be in his own home with a ghost, he called upon the local priest, came to the home and looked upon the kimono and nodded. Ah, 
your lone daughter, she died with much longing. And that longing holds her to this world. She's attached to this kimono and she will remain with it. Do not give it away for you will be giving that longing to another and dangerous things will come of it. Here, let us purify this kimono. Let us set her free. Let us say rights and let us do well by her so that she may go on to come again and again. And they burn that kimono then and set the ashes to rest. No more did the merchant hear his daughter humming in the evening, longingly, as if waiting for better times that would not come. So be careful, dear friends, be careful with the things that you love. Make sure they're not cast aside heedlessly, for you never know who may be visited next by the longing and the emotion attached to such things. And this brings us to another of our host of ghosts, yure, dim spirits, which of course is frequently translated as ghosts, much like the mononoke, these spirits of uh, transmutable nature. Ghosts can take many forms and not only longing and sadness, but also rage and vengeance. And we've met many of them perhaps before, Maybe you didn't know it. Films like Dingyu and Juon very much harken back to the Onryo, the grudge spirits, who might have died in terrible situations where their last feeling, their last wish was that of hate and suffering. And that takes on a life of its own, much like those trickster spirits, but in dark and different ways. And those stories that get told again and again, um, they take on a life of their own and they transform and they continue. Probably some of the most famous are Oiwa. Oiwa, unfortunately, um, came into a bad marriage and her husband ended up doing away with her to steal her money and her position. But we see Oiwa again and again in Onmyo in those vengeful spirits, her long disheveled black hair, her white face, her burial shroud, white kimono. And there's a reason why we see the ghosts the way that we do, because we see that image echoed forward again and again. There's another ghost that I'd like to introduce you tonight, older still than Oiwa, Okiku and the Ten Plates. Okiku was a servant at the Osaka castle long, long ago. Okiku was very smart. Unfortunately, she was also very beautiful and that caused her no end of trouble. Okiku worked in the castle's kitchens and she was tasked with keeping track of the 10 famous plates. These plates had come from far, far away and a land called the Netherlands. And these plates were made of strange thick ceramic and painted by blue, and they had to be stored in very careful ways lest they crack and break and never be able to be fixed again. And so unfortunately, whilst amongst her duties, Okiku happened to catch the eye of a young lord working at the castle that young man had a black, black heart and nothing could fill it. Unfortunately for Kiku, he would not leave her alone. He would was always pestering her, oh Kiku, how pretty you are. Please come and serve me. Oh Kiku, you should come here, come here. And no, she knew what he wanted. And so she stayed far, far away from that young lord. So frustrated was he that his black heart took him even further into terrible realm. And he stole one of Okiku's plates and he broke it purposefully, knowing that she would have nothing to do but to turn to him for help. And unfortunately, she came upon that broken plate and saw what had happened. That, and that young Lord came creeping out of the dark. Oh, look what you did, Okiku. Look what you did, you broke the plate. This was your duty, they will punish you, but I can help. I can help, and if you are good to me, I will be good to you. And Okiku spurned that young lord, 
and he said, no, no, this is my duty. This is my plate. I will stand before. I will own what is due. Unfortunately, the next day, it was discovered that the plate was broken, but none could find Okiku. Some whispered, oh, she must have run off. Oh, you know, she must have run off. And the young lord was very puzzled, like, where, where, well, she didn't run off with me. Who did she run off with? Until, unfortunately, they found in the well behind the castle um, something that did not belong. For Okiku had taken matters into her own hands in the only way that she could. And much sadness came upon the castle because Okiku was a good girl, a bright soul, and they were sad to see her meet such a terrible end. How sad, how sad, they whispered. And the young lord went, huh, well, more pretty girls elsewhere. Yeah. Not too many nights after that, the young lord was sleeping restlessly. He couldn't quite get comfortable. It's a little too cold, a little too hot, something not quite right. The rest of the castle was slumbering quite well, but not him. And in the middle of the night, he heard a strange, strange sound. The nightingale floors were similar, for they were designed to creep and crack whenever anyone passed near. Closer and closer those creeps came, and with them a voice. Was that on Kiku? One, two, three, four. Her voice was outside his door. That door did not open. The floor did not creak inside. But a shadow appeared outside his mosquito netting. Shape of a woman and her phantom voice. Five, six, seven, eight. Closer that shadow drifted, putting a chill of horror across the young lord as he recognized, yes, yes indeed, that was Okiku, dripping from the water from the well. I was standing just beyond his curtains, but no feet upon the floor with which to cause it to creak. Okiku, is that you? Her white hand clutched at the mosquito netting. Nine. Nine plates upon the wall the next morning. Tenth forever gone. Much like Okiku. Much like the young lord. Unfortunately, they never found him, but there were whisperings, whisperings the next morning, for they found upon the floor, staining the way all the way from the well up to the Lord's door, wet footprints, so soaked into the floor that it took years for them to be scrubbed out. And that, dear friends, brings us to the end of our first half of the program. Let's take a 10-minute break. Go and get yourself another cup of tea and then come back and settle back in. All right, friends, are you ready for some more stories? Before we get back into the program, one more shameless librarian plug. If you're interested in reading more about yure and the tradition of ghosts specifically in Japan, the library has a fantastic book called Yure, the Japanese Ghost, written by a local scholar named Zach Davison. And we have two copies of it because I bought two copies. And you can use our new curbside delivery service to request a copy uh, through social distance measures. And then you can read more about all kinds of folklore foundations for the, the ghosts with the most. 
And so here we go for the rest of our program. And a tale of a ghost of a different type. It's interesting how many spooky stories end up with woodcutters involved. Something about folks going out into the forest, right? Well, the forest is said to belong to the gods. And that's a special relationship that needs to be honored. Hence, the young apprentice of the old woodcutter is very much respectful in his duties as he's followed along from the small village at the outskirts of the deep forest. All times of year, they went in summer, in the fall, and even in the winter, where those were the times that they could always count upon the best prices as people's stores began to grow thin. So off they went, even though the snow was definitely showing upon the mountains. Off they went into the deep woods to get their wares to sell in town. But on the way back, such a blizzard struck that they had no hope of getting home that night. And so they took shelter in an old shack right at the edge of the woods. And there they had to spend the evening, just them, at the edge of the woods. How strange, how strange it was to be so far from their beds. Listening out into the night, hearing the howl of the snow billowing by. How strange it was, sound of innocent footsteps, some pumps would fall from the roof. It almost like someone was making quick to come into the hut, when the front flap rattled open and shut as the wind. By, shivering in his coat, that young apprentice held up beside his desk and tried, tried, tried to fall asleep. Whether he was awake or asleep, he wasn't quite sure. But in the midst of the night, when finally the storms had settled, he swore he heard the front flap open and close. Laid there in the dark, he saw a white glistening shadow move past. The most beautiful woman he had ever seen in his life. Skin pale white, like the freshest fallen snow. Glowing gold eyes like the moon, full upon the far horizon. Long black hair free and flowing, like the darkest ebony silk threads upon a whistling moon. Up she came, past him to lean over the old man. And as she did, her breath blew like a crystalline plume, freezing the very air, freezing everything all around them. Terrified, the young man held even further and refused to look as she turned from the old man to look at him. And he thought he heard her chuckle and say, you, pretty boy, you, oh handsome man, you, I will not live. Off this nightmare glided into the snow. Thinking it nothing more than a dream, the young man went back to sleep. In the morning, as the birds chirped and the sun finally warmed the chill, he returned to his master to tell him what a strange dream he had had until he discovered his master was frozen solid. For it was not a dream, or was it? He could not tell. But he swore, he swore, as that ghostly shadow left, it make him a promise. Tell no one of me, young man, and you, you shall live. Many years passed, and that young woodcutter grew older until he took over the business for himself. Off into the woods he went by himself, it did not bother him. He was at home amongst the strange there. Until on the one of his trips back, he came across a young woman along the road. Long black hair she had, like the, the softest, glossiest silk upon the loom. White skin, like fresh fallen snow, with bright eyes, bright as the moon. As he came alongside her, she smiled, and he smiled, as young folk often do. And he asked, young woman, young woman, where are you going? I am going to the village. I am looking for work there. 
I was like, oh, oh well, let me let me walk with you. I know a way. Can I carry your bag for you? Oh no, young man, that's very kind. Oh, I am always happy to help. He was a good soul in fact. So what is your name, young woman? Yuki, Snow. And as young people do, they got to talking until they felt quite pleased with themselves by the time that they got to the village. For um, one could say that they um, had made an arrangement, and perhaps even for a marriage soon. And indeed that came to pass, and they had many children together, much like their mother they were, strong, unusually strong, and not bothered at all by the winter cold, with beautiful, beautiful white skin, black glossy hair. And they were happy together, happy indeed. And as the years went by and the children grew bigger, he, the young woodcutter was no longer so young, Sitting by the fire in the midst of winter, he heard the howling wind outside and thought back into that dreamy place he had once been. Wife, wife, have you ever heard the snow speak? And she paused in the midst of her work and she turned an ear to her husband and she said to him, what do you mean? And the young woodcutter told her the story of long ago when he was in the midst of winter and saw that frightful dream. Was it a dream? Was it real? So startled was he as his wife flew to her feet and tossed down the work that she was doing, glaring at him, standing over him, towering up into that nightmarish figure he had seen before. You, she said, you, as her breath blew in that crystalline plume to freeze the very air and freeze the very home that they had made for themselves. I made a promise to you, young man, said nothing of me were you to do, and now you have broken that promise. You have broken that promise, and I cannot stay, not for the children in the next room. I would freeze you solid. And with that screech from her lips, she turned into a howling gale that extinguished all fire and warmth from the house, went screaming out through the chimney. That was the bitterest winter that the village ever knew. And they swore, they swore, they heard a woman screeching in the wind, dropping her footfalls throughout the snow along the edges of the warmth that she could never have, rattling the doors to their homes, trying to find a way back into what she had lost at the hearth with that young man and the home that she would never have once more. And so be careful, dear friends, be careful what you invite in. We never know what is made out of snow. And that brings us to our next story, friends. For be careful, be careful. Things are not always what they seem, particularly when it comes to the story about the lady who ate a baby. This story begins with three young men, unfortunately, three out of seven. And so very little chance that they have at the home for themselves that they had been brought up in. There was the eldest of the three, the middle of the three, and the youngest. The eldest was quite strong, a burly man, able to lift both of his brothers from the ground without ever showing the shred of effort. The middle was wily and skinny, full of brains, that one, but not so much in the way of brawn. And the third brother, well, his heart was gold. And he looked after his older and middle brother for always they were getting themselves into trouble. Off they went onto the road to make their own fortunes for there was none to be had at home. And they journeyed far and wide doing what work they could to sustain themselves until in a village way high in the mountains where people were stranger than normal, they came across a story at one of the local tea houses. Apparently there was a rich landowner his daughter was said to be the most beautiful woman in all of the land and he had a challenge for any man that could come by and should they meet that challenge he would offer them their his daughter's hand in marriage and the brothers thought to themselves huh how strange that none has yet met that challenge what have we to lose let us go try let us see what this challenge is so off to the grand mansion they went off to meet the head man there who stood on his front steps and gestured out in front of him at the rice fields before him, 
three fields there were of equal size, three brothers of different talents. And he said unto them, you three, whoever can till their field first will win. And so no matter what happens, that householder got his fields tilled, but these brothers, they made more work for themselves than was necessary. The older brother, though strong, was not the brightest. And he was always being tripped up by his middle brother, who was trying to convince him to do his work for him without actually doing anything himself. And the poor third brother oh, looked on and sighed and tried to maneuver them both into doing something, anything, so that they wouldn't embarrass themselves. Perhaps then, with the work they had done, they would at least be able to beg a meal. And after all of their squabbling between the old and the middle, and all the coaxing and cajoling of the youngest, they got all three fields tilled at the exact same time. And that head man looked out over his tilled fields and said, ha, well, you all three have finished the challenge as one. I cannot send one of you out and not keep the other. Stay, stay. Tomorrow I'm sure I can think of another challenge. And perhaps yet one of you might win my daughter's hand. In came the three brothers and sat themselves down to an amazing feast. More food that they had eaten in days and days. And the youngest brother did his best to help his brothers with their manners and to make a good impression. Always said thank you to he to all of the servants. But strange, how strange that the lady of the house had yet to show herself. Strange, was she sick? Was she not as beautiful as they said? And the curiosity crept upon the oldest and the middle brother as they whispered to themselves rudely at the table. And sigh and sigh did the youngest brother for he knew that there was trouble to be had here. Later that night, as they struggled to sleep in the great room that had been set aside for them, the older brother and the middle brother thought, oh, let's go sneak a peek. Surely she's here somewhere. Let's go sneak a peek. She must be beautiful. Why would she hide away if not? Maybe she's old. Maybe she has a wart on her nose. No, she can't have a wart on her nose. Well, who knows? And out they crept into that house in the middle of the night. Off they went down the hall as the youngest brother tried to coax them back, tried to contend with their curiosity and say, wait, wait, no, no, but they could not be persuaded. Off they went into the great house, skulking through the halls like villains, until they came upon the ladies' wing of the house, and they saw a flickering of light through the rice paper, and they heard a shuttle working. And they thought, ah, this must be the beautiful young woman. Up they crept and parted the door just a tiny little bit as that meeting, uh, as that shuttle paused for a moment for her to take a break. Through the crack in the door, they saw the most beautiful robe um, falling from her shoulders like a great red sunset, long and glossy black hair, like the deepest midnight. Oh, this must be the lady indeed, but we can't see her face. She was faced away from them, in fact. As she went over to the corner, there seemed to be a cradle in the middle of the room there. How strange, how strange. Is this her child? As she went over to the cradle, out of it, she took a baby and brought close to herself, but not to hold it dear. Such hideous sounds filtering from afar as that woman tore into that baby as if it was a thief, ripping and tearing and gnashing and eating a baby. Horrified, the brothers ran off out of the house, out of the grand estate, out of the village, off into the night. Not even they left their youngest brother. How terrible, how terrible. And so Eventually, as time went on, the youngest brother thought to himself, oh dear, my brothers are not back. Something has happened. Something has gone awry. I must go apologize. Off he went into that long dark hall, trying to find his brothers. But in the distance, he saw the same thing they had, light beyond the paper. As he crept up, he saw the crack in the door 
Left behind all surely his brothers had been here. Surely they had taken a peek. But as he went to close the, that crack in the door, he caught a glimpse of movement through and saw the lady there again going to eat something strange and wait is that mochi oh mochi and sweet red bean paste because he was very interested in food and he realized oh that's not a baby this is a trick and as that beautiful woman brought an arm to her mouth and turned to bare her teeth she offered to him one sound he parted the doors and reached and said, yes, yes, I'll have some. And as she turned around, the hideous visage of horns and grinning teeth revealed itself to be a mask. And indeed the feast of flesh turned out to be nothing more than sweet red bean paste and um, mochi. And as the lady of the house took off her mask to reveal, she was indeed beautiful, but better than that, she was smart. She said to the youngest brother, you, you are brave, but not only that, you are kind. I saw the way you treated the servants. I saw the way you tried to coax your brothers to be better. You, you have a good heart, and that is worth more to me than anything. Stay, stay a while, and continue to prove your good heart to me. And the youngest brother did, and eventually they were wed. And eventually the youngest brother coaxed back his older brothers and taught them how to be better, much as he did for all who came under his care, as well as the lady who ate a baby. Continuing our stories now, we have one for you all from our wonderful president of Japanese Culture Club of A Bell and a Mirror, narrated by Oliver. Let me tell you all a story of a mirror and a bell. Centuries ago, in the present-day Shizuka prefecture, the priests of Mugenyama wanted a big bell for their temple. They asked the women of their parish to help by contributing their old bronze mirrors to forge into the bell. Among these women lived a farmer's wife, who presented her mirror to the temple. However, she very much regretted giving up her mirror, as it held precious memories of not only her, but of her mother, her mother's mother, and even her great-grandmother. Of course, she could have asked for her heirloom back from the priests in exchange for a small fortune, but as a mere farmer's wife, she did not have such money. Whenever she went to the temple, she saw her mirror lying in the courtyard, behind a railing amongst hundreds of mirrors given by the other woman. She longed for the chance to steal it back and to hide it, but that chance did not come, and she became very unhappy. She felt like she had foolishly given away a part of her life, and remembered the old saying, a mirror is the soul of a woman. Even with this, she could not bring herself to speak her pain to anybody. The time came when all the mirrors for the bell were set to the foundry for melting. But when the mirrors were put into the forge, there was one that would not melt. Again and again they tried to melt it, but it never warped, nor cracked, under the heat of the furnace's fire. The woman who had given that mirror to the temple must have regretted giving it up. She had not presented her offering with all her heart, and so her selfish soul remained attached to her mirror 
keeping it hard and cold within the flames. Of course, the word spread of this unmelting mirror, and the farmer's wife would eventually be exposed publicly for this. She soon became ashamed and angry, to the point where it was all unbearable. She drowned herself, leaving a final farewell letter, reading, When I am dead, it will not be difficult to melt the mirror and cast the bell. But to the person who breaks that bell by ringing it, great wealth will be given by the ghost of me. It was known that the last wish or promise of anybody who dies in anger generally possesses a supernatural force. And so, after the deceased woman's mirror was melted down and the Mugen Yama bell was successfully passed, people remembered the promise written by her. As soon as the bell had been suspended in the court of the temple, many people came down to ring it with all their might. They swung the ringing beam over and over, but the bell proved to be a good bell and withstood their assaults. Nevertheless, the people kept swinging and ringing and swinging and ringing day after day, even against the protests of the priests in the temple. The priests could not endure the constant chiming of the bell, and so they got rid of the bell, moving it from the temple courtyard to the top of the hill where a swamp laid at the base. The bell was rolled down into the deep swamp, which swallowed it up, being the last of the Muginyama bell. Only its legend remains, and in that legend it is called Mugen no Kane, or Mugen's Bell. of the evening, which again echoes the dying wish promise. This is another of Lafcadio O'Hearn's most famous stories, uh, and it's called Diplomacy. Sometimes there is no justice in justice. The unfortunate thing with a crime is that it must be accompanied by a punishment. And so the prisoner was brought before the Lord of the region and all knew that this man was innocent, but the guilty could not be had. So their closest kin was taken instead. This man was to be put to death. And as he was brought out into the courtyard, so angry was this young man, so very, very angry as he was brought before the great Lord Upon his knees, he made the promise that he would come back and haunt everyone here, for they knew that this was an injustice, but none were brave enough to stand up for him. And the great Lord went up to this young man and said, what proof have I that you can um, do this thing that you promise? Show me, show me that you 
can come back and haunt us all. And that young man grew angrier and angrier as the Lord taunted him. I will, I will, I promise, I promise that I will come back. And oh, such a chill fell over the crowd. They thought to themselves, how horrible, how horrible to be haunted for the rest of their lives. And the, the Lord said, well, what will you do? What will you do to prove that you can come back? You see that stone there? Could you bite that stone? And that young man said, yes, yes, after you cut off my head, I will bite that stone. And then you will know that my wrath is real and will be revisited upon you. I will bite it. And so as the, everyone shivered in terror, knowing what was about to happen, the Lord drew his sword and from his shoulders, the head was struck from the young man and it rolled and took on a life of its own and tumbled toward that stone and then bit it with such force it shattered in two. Oh, such terror, such terror rolled through that entire castle complex. No one could go about their work. No one could sleep. Everyone was terrified to know of this vengeful spirit, this omnia that was to return at any moment. Until finally, one amongst the men was brave enough to go to seek out their counsel of the Lord, for he was not afraid. He went about his business, he slept in his bed, he ate his food as if nothing had happened, and if, as if they had not witnessed this horrifying event. Great Lord, how is it that you are so calm and collected after seeing this supernatural thing happen? And the Lord looked at his man and said, huh? Diplomacy. The dying wish is indeed an awesome thing to be feared. But what was it that that young man promised us? What did he say he would do as soon as his head was struck from his shoulders? Did he say that he would come back and haunt us? Or did he say he would bite a stone? And that soldier sat back in surprise and realized there was nothing more to fear. For that dying wish had indeed been granted and no more was heard. And our last story of the evening follows the Hyakumonikatari Kaidan Kai tradition of each person telling their own ghost story to add a little bit of flavor to the evening, make it a little bit more real. And so um, my sister lived in Japan for two years, and I was very fortunate to go and visit her each season in the wintertime. This is my sister Jackie. Shout out to my mom and sisters, Jackie and Julie. I love you. Um, and so uh, we decided to go on a trip to Nikko. Nikko is in the central part of the main island. It's a really amazing place. It's kind of like if you were to mix the Washington Monument with Yosemite. It has the natural setting of just spectacular beauty, but it's also the, um, the resting place for uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu, um, and so the shrine complexes there are really famous um, historically. It, but it was also bitter cold. Um, you can see Kegon Falls in the background of this photo. Um, there, those icicles by the, um, the the falls are as big as I am. So we literally watched a lake freeze in front of us. Um, it, so this is right, um, right before, no, it's right after New Year's because it's right before my birthday. Um, so we went out here in the middle of nowhere and it was really fascinating because everybody goes home for New Year's, but this town was pretty much empty. Um, it was almost just us in many of the places that we were going. And so it's a really uh, fascinating, beautiful historical place, but it's also very spooky. Um, it's the site of the Kamangafuki Abyss, which is a ravine, a canyon that has all kinds of strange phenomena associated with it, including the Baki Jizo. Jizo is a bodhisattva that's supposed to help you um, lost children and people who are stuck between their lives. And so you can see in the photo here, these little statues represent Jizo, and they've got little offering um, 
uh, votive offerings. It's like, that's what the red is. They're like little hats and little bibs. Um, they, it said that if you count these, you can never get the same number. Jackie and I counted three times and we got three separate numbers. And so it, it was just, um, everything was buzzing with um, a spiritual energy. It, it was a fascinating place to be. And so um, uh, we went out um, for um, a bunch of walks and we discovered that there were graveyards all over the place. Um, the photo on the left is the view from our um, uh, uh, hotel room right across the river what was a cemetery complex because this is a very sacred site. So there's lots of really interesting things to see. And um, uh, the, some of the stories that I read were about um, Hitodama. Hitodama are, are um, um, spirits basically. They're like will of the whips. They're blue balls of fire that are associated with um, places of great spiritual energy. And so um, what happened to us, this is our ghost story, is we went out to dinner, on my birthday dinner. We went and had the most fabulous meal um, that I've had in a really long time. And we went to a Chinese food restaurant and it was so good. And everyone was so kind and sweet. We just had a lovely time. And we decided as we got done with the restaurant that we would walk home a different way. So instead of going the way we came, we continued down the street and decided we were gonna take um, uh, a right and just see what happened and see where we ended up. Well, um, this is where we ended up. So um, you can see in the top right corner of the screenshot, there is a light on a post. Well, guess what friends, when we were there, there was no light on a post. So we come around the corner here and um, we notice that it just gets pitch black. And on one side is a shrine complex. And we know that it is a shrine complex because of the stone guardians. And you can see the roof line and all of that. But as we went down the street, it got pitch black. And with a send our way down the, the road in abject terror, just like, we're so sorry, we're so sorry, we're so sorry, we're so sorry. And um, one of the little ones, because there were big ones and there were little ones, one of the little ones literally just appeared right at the corner looking at us like, why are you here? What are you doing? Go home, go home. And then it teleported from that corner to that corner. And it, it, Jackie screamed and threw herself at me because we literally saw it was there and then it was there. And we went. And it, you should know something about me, friends. I don't run. Neither one of us run. But we ran a five minute mile. Oh my God, we ran. <laughs> <laughs> so we ran all the way back to our hostel where we, we collapsed on the front porch. We were crying. We were laughing. We had no idea what just happened. But oh, my God. And we were not safe. No, not safe. Not safe. <laughs> so we got back to the hotel. Um, we got back to our room. We um, had some cheesecake and we watched some Japanese TV. And then we went to bed. And then later that night, the big mamas came to check in on us. So, you know, in um, uh, 
the silly ghost stories, you pull the blanket over your head and you can't have any part of your body exit the blanket, otherwise we'll be eaten. Yes, so Jackie and I both hid underneath our quilts. If I could have crawled underneath my futon, I would have. And we literally held our breath until morning as they like circled the room all night long. And so eventually we did wake up, thankfully we woke up and the next morning and we both dragged ourselves to breakfast in silence. And at breakfast, we um, uh, had a lovely breakfast, by the way, an amazing food at this place. Um, but we both uh, got a Mekon with breakfast. And we both looked at the Mekon and we looked at each other because Mekon are traditionally given as offerings um, at um, temples and shrines. And we both reached and took our Mekon and set it off to the side and kind of went to one another like, yes, we, we have an agreed upon plan. And so um, after breakfast, we took our Mekon back to the shrine. In the day, we went up to the shrine and we did, you know, our ablutions and we went up and we made our Mekon offering. And we were like, so lovely to meet you last night. Thank you so much for humoring us. Thank you so much for coming to check on us. We're here to do research. We were so grateful for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Not a problem after that. No problems whatsoever. So the moral of the story is be polite and bring Mekon. And dear friends, thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming to join us tonight. Um, we really appreciate you um, uh, supporting Japanese Culture Club and taking an interest in traditional folk stories. Um, take care of each other.